Blood in My Eye by George L. Jackson Toward the United Front A new Unitarian and progressive current has sprung up in the movement centering on political prisoners. How can this Unitarian conduct be developed further in the face of determined resistance from the establishment? How can it be used to isolate reactionary elements? Unitary conduct implies a search for those elements in our present situation which can become the basis for joint action. It involves a conscious reaching for the relevant, the intente, and especially, in our case, the reconcilable. Throughout the centralizing authoritarian process of American history, the ruling classes have found it necessary to discourage and punish any genuine opposition to hierarchy. But there have always been individuals and groups who rejected the ideal of two unequal societies existing one on top of the other. The men who placed themselves above the rest of society through guile, fortuitous outcome of circumstance, and sheer brutality have developed two principal institutions to deal with any and all serious disobedience, the prison and institutionalized racism. There are more prisons of all categories in the United States than in all other countries of the world combined. At all times, there are two-thirds of a million people or more confined to these prisons. Hundreds are destined to be legally executed, thousands more quasi-legally. Other thousands will never again have any freedom of movement, barring a revolutionary change in all the institutions that combine to make up the order of things. One third of a million people may not seem like a great number compared with the total population of 200 million. However, compared with the one million who are responsible for all the affairs of men within the extended state, it constitutes a striking contrast. What I want to explore now are a few of the subtle elements that I have observed to be standing in the path of a much-needed united front, non-sectarian, to effectively reverse this legitimized ripoff. Prisons were not institutionalized on such a massive scale by the people. Most people realize that crime is simply the result of a grossly disproportionate distribution of wealth and privilege, a reflection of the present state of property relations. There are no wealthy men on death row, and so few in the general prison population that we can discount them altogether. Imprisonment is an aspect of class struggle from the outset. It is the creation of a closed society which attempts to isolate those individuals who disregard the structures of a hypocritical establishment as well as those who attempt to challenge it on a mass basis. Throughout its history, the United States has used its prisons to suppress any organized efforts to challenge its legitimacy, from its attempts to break up the early Working Men's Benevolent Association to the baning of the Communist Party during what I regard as the fascist takeover of this country, to the attempts to destroy the Black Panther Party. The hypocrisy of American fascism forces it to conceal its attack on political offenders by the legal fiction of conspiracy laws and highly sophisticated frame-ups. The masses must be taught to understand the true function of prisons. Why do they exist in such numbers? What is the real underlying economic motive of crime and the official definition of types of offenders or victims? The people must learn that when one offends the totalitarian state, it is patently not an offense against the people of that state, but an assault upon the privilege of the privileged few. Could anything be more ridiculous than the language of blatantly political indictments, the people of the state versus Angela Davis and Rachel McGee, or the people of the state versus Bobby Seale and Erica Huggins? What people? Clearly the hierarchy, the armed minority. We must educate the people in the real causes of economic crimes. They must be made to realize that even crimes of passion are the psychosocial effects of an economic order that was decadent a hundred years ago. 
All crime can be traced to objective socio-economic conditions, socially productive or counterproductive activity. In all cases, it is determined by the economic system, the method of economic organization. The people of the state versus John Doe is as tenuous as the clearly political frame-ups. It's like stating the people versus the people, man against himself. Official definitions of crime are simply attempts by the establishment to suppress the forces of progress. Prisoners must be reached and made to understand that they are victims of social injustice. This is my task working from within. While I'm here, my persuasion is that the war goes on no matter where one may find himself on bourgeois-dominated soil. The sheer numbers of the prisoner class and the terms of their existence make them a mighty reservoir of revolutionary potential. Working alone and from within a steel-enclosed society, there is very little that people like myself can do to awake the restrained potential revolutionary outside the walls. That is part of the task of the prison movement. The prison movement, the August 7th movement, and all similar efforts educate the people in the illegitimacy of establishment power and hint at the ultimate goal of revolutionary consciousness at every level of struggle. The goal is always the same, the creation of an infrastructure capable of fielding a people's army. Each of us should understand that revolution is aggressive. The manipulators of the system cannot or will not meet our legitimate demands. Eventually, this will move us all into a violent encounter with the system. These are the terminal years of capitalism, and as we move into more and more basic challenges to its rule, history clearly forewarns us that when the prestige of power fails, a violent episode precedes its transformation. We can attempt to limit the scope and range of violence in revolution by mobilizing as many partisans as possible at every level of socio-economic life. But given the hold that the ruling class has on this country and its history of violence, nothing could be more certain than civil disorders, perhaps even civil war. I don't dread either. There are no good aspects of monopoly capital, so no reservations need be recognized in its destruction. Monopoly capital is the enemy. It crushes the life force of all of the people. It must be completely destroyed as quickly as possible, utterly, totally, ruthlessly, relentlessly destroyed. With this as a common major goal, it would seem that anti-establishment forces would find little difficulty in developing common initiatives and methods consistent with goals of mass society. Regretfully, this has not been the case. Only the prison movement has shown any promise of cutting across the ideological, racial, and cultural barricades that have blocked the natural coalition of left-wing forces at all times in the past. So this movement must be used to provide an example for the partisans engaged at other levels of struggle. The issues involved and the dialectic which flows from an understanding of the clear objective existence of overt oppression could be the springboard for our entry into the tide of increasing worldwide socialist consciousness. In order to create a united left whose aim is the defense of political prisoners and prisoners in general, we must renounce the idea that all participants must be of one mind and should work at the problem from a single party line or with a single party line or with a single method. The reverse of this is actually desirable. From all according to ability, each partisan outside the vanguard elements should work at radicalizing in the area of their natural environment, the places where they pursue their normal lives when not attending the rallies and demonstrations. The vanguard elements, organized party workers of all ideological persuasions, should go among the people concentrated at the rallying point with consciousness-raising strategy, promoting commitment and providing concrete, clearly defined activity. The vanguard elements must search out people who can and will contribute to the building of the commune.
the infrastructure with pen and clipboard in hand. For those who aren't ready to take that step, a packet of pamphlets should be provided for their education. All of this, of course, means that we are moving, and on a mass level, not all in our separate directions, but firmly under the disciplined and principled leadership of the vanguard Black Panther Communist Party. One simply cannot act without a head. Democratic centralism is the only way to deal effectively with the American ordeal. The Central Committee of the People's Vanguard Party must make its presence felt throughout the various levels of the overall movement. With the example of unity in the prison movement, we can begin to break the old behavioral patterns that have repeatedly allowed bourgeois capitalism, its imperialism, and fascism to triumph over the last several decades. We tap a massive potential reservoir of partisans for cadre work. We make it possible to begin to address one of the most complex psychosocial byproducts that economic man with his private enterprise has manufactured, racism. I've saved this most critical barrier to our needs of unity for last. Racism is a matter of ingrained traditional attitudes conditioned through institutions. For some, it is as natural a reflex as breathing. The psychosocial effects of segregated environments, compounded by bitter class repression, have served in the past to render the progressive movement almost totally impotent. The major obstacle to a united left in this country is white racism. There are three categories of white racists. The overt, self-satisfied racist who doesn't attempt to hide his antipathy. The self-interdicting racist who harbors and nurtures racism in spite of his best efforts. And the unconscious racist who has no awareness of his racist preconceptions. I deny the existence of black racism outright. By fiat, I deny it. Too much black blood has flowed between the chasm that separates the races. It's fundamentally unfair to expect the black man to differentiate at a glance between the various kinds of white racists. What the apologists term black racism is either a healthy defense reflex on the part of the sincere black partisan who is attempting to deal with the realistic problems of survival and elevation or the racism of the government stooge organs. As black partisans, we must recognize and allow for the existence of all three types of racists. We must understand their presence as an effect of the system. It is the system that must be crushed, for it continues to manufacture new and deeper contradictions of both class and race. Once it is destroyed, we may be able to address the problems of racism at an even more basic level. But we must also combat racism while we are in the process of destroying the system. The self-interdicting racist, no matter what his acquired conviction or ideology, will seldom be able to contribute with his actions in any really concrete way. His role in revolution, barring a change of basic character, will be minimal throughout. Whether the basic character of a man can be changed at all is still a question. But we have, in the immediacy of the issues in question, the perfect opportunity to test the validity of materialist philosophy again. Because we don't have to guess, we have the means of proof. The need for Unitarian conduct goes much deeper than the liberation of Angela, Bobby, Erica, McGee, Lociete, Tijerina, white draft resistors, and now the indomitable and faithful James Carr. We have fundamental strategy to be proved, tested, and proved. The activity surrounding the protection and liberation of people who fight for us is an important aspect of the struggle, but it is important only if it provides new initiatives that redirect and advance the revolution under new progressive methods. There must be a collective redirection of the old guard, the factory and union agitator, with the campus activists who can counter the ill effects of fascism at its training site, and with the lumpen proletariat intellectuals who possess revolutionary scientific socialist attitudes to deal with the masses of street people already living outside the system. 
they must work toward developing the unity of the pamphlet and the silenced pistol. Black, brown, and white are all victims together. At the end of this massive collective struggle, we will uncover our new man, the unpredictable culmination of the revolutionary process. He will be better equipped to wage the real struggle, the permanent struggle after the revolution, the one for new relationships between men.